Dr. Burke and I both have vestibular migraine, actually. Um, I have chronic vestibular migraine, and Dr. Burke has... Episodic. Yep, episodic. Um, so we can explain how our experiences differ um, and how our attacks differ, which I think can be interesting for people. Um, so why don't you you go first? Talk Absolutely. About your, yeah, yeah. Your yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, not every migraine that I've ever had, but I would say maybe the majority of them have actually started with a severe vestibular symptom. Basically, it's a, a room spinning sensation. First, I kind of just feel a little unwell, uh, maybe a little sensitive to light and a little lightheaded. And then uh, I get this really, really severe room spinning sensation and severe nausea, light sensitivity, and uh, it's lasted for me between 45 minutes and, uh, you know, I'd say close to an hour, not exactly. And uh, shortly after, I'd say most of the time, I'll have a really severe debilitating actual like headache pain uh, together with it. Um, the things that work for me for the most part are trying as much as I can to hydrate, cooling myself down. So, I, you know, sometimes I've, I've had like ice packs all over everywhere and uh, anti-nausea type medicines tends have been helpful. Um, some of the newer oral CGRP medications have helped me also. Um, and uh, episodic, so it doesn't happen very often, but uh, when it happens, it stops me from being able to conduct my normal, you know, daily business. And I've even, you know, if it's happened suddenly and I've had to, Fortunately, I had to you know reschedule patients you know very very suddenly. Don't don't think that 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 it happens very often by, by any stretch of the imagination. But when you tell us because you know we come with the same perspective that this uh, limits your life. It's it's uh, you know something that completely uproots what you want to to you know try to get accomplished. We understand that we've been there. Sometimes we are there. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we've been there very, very recently. So that's, um, you know, that's, that's my story. And, and your vestibular migraine is very different. Yeah. Yeah. So I have chronic vestibular, vestibular migraine and, um, I have a baseline dizziness. It's, it's a very low grade baseline dizziness. Um, I would say now it's, it's well managed with preventive medication. Um, so it's just, just a little uneasy feeling, a little bit like I'm on a boat. And then my peripheral vision, especially in the right eye, is always blurry and my um, depth perception, I, I do not trust my depth perception ever. Um, and so that's kind of how mine is at baseline. And then I will have moments of, of stronger dizziness and um, vertigo from time to time. And I will get the a more classic vestibular migraine attack. Um, I had one the other day and it felt like everything was undulating and so it was like this sensation um and that lasted for i i would say a couple of days um and i i used my cephaly and i used nurtech and i was able to get that back to baseline but it i on sunday i had to go to dave and busters with my with my little nibbling and that was that was not a fun place to be during the vestibular wow, right, absolutely. <laughs> and he all was, the triggers. Yeah, he mm -hmm. was wanting me to do all of the games. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't see, like, the Jurassic Park game, all the games I usually play with them, I couldn't see anything, and I couldn't focus on anything. Um, so that's what my experience is like. Um, so I see that we're starting to have questions. Um, someone wanted to know about 3PD. 3PD, so... Uh, it's gone through a few different names, but the, the name that we have for it right now is 3PD, which is basically Persistent Perceptual Postural Dizziness. And um, it's a little different, I would say, than vestibular migraine. The implication for the most part is that it isn't migraine itself or the process of migraine in the brain that's causing that kind of symptom. Um, sometimes it can be very difficult just going through what you actually notice and, and, and feel when the episodes happen. Sometimes a vestibular migraine episode can look just like a 3PD episode or another kind of vertigo like BPPV, which is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So a lot of times it isn't so much 
the symptom that you're having as much as it is what is driving that symptom. Uh, and if it's something like BPPV, it's little rocks in your ears com coming out of place. That really has nothing to do with migraine. If it's vestibular migraine, it's the process of migraine that ha that's happening uh, in your brain. And if you look at the, you know, uh, the, the, the definitions for all of these things, um, they are slightly different with regards to, you know, maybe some subtle things. Oftentimes with vestibular migraine, there will be, although there doesn't always have to be, a headache associated with the vestibular symptoms. With 3PD, usually there isn't, although one very tricky situation is somebody who has migraine and 3PD, and the question is, what's the best way of treating it? Mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of medications that seem to be best for 3PD are things like SSRI-type antidepressants, and the things that seem to help, uh, let's say, vestibular migraine are some specific things for vestibular migraine, but um, uh, often that will be a different kind of antidepressant, different class, like an SNRI antidepressant. So um, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll see you in consultation with maybe an ENT or somebody who is especially trained, either ENT, you know, based or neurology based neurootologist. We were just talking about people who are, you know, uh, had this kind of subspecialty and uh, their insights can be really helpful because they can tell us whether there's any what we call peripheral vestibulopathy. Is there any problem with the ear that's really driving some of these symptoms or not? And sometimes looking at the patterns of nystagmus, the way that your eyes move during these episodes, uh, that can actually tell you a lot. I'll tell you during my episodes, I remember my wife was like very freaked out by this. Even when my eyes are closed, my, my, my eyes are dotting back and forth and back and forth, completely unstoppable. Yeah, I, I remember when I first had vestibular, when I first was diagnosed with vestibular migraine and I was going through vestibular rehab therapy, I also got BPPV. Mm -hmm. And the best way she described it that really helped me understand it is BPPV was more like bed dizziness. So when mm -hmm. you rolled over in bed, you would exactly. get vertigo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with vestibular migraine, it's an ongoing sense oh, yeah. of dizziness. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like a, a easy way for me to tell the difference between that um, or to distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and that that was kind of how we were able to do it. And then she, we did several weeks of aptly maneuvers and got those little crystals back into place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so I see that we have some other questions um, and someone wanted to know about like stopping meds if it's help helping as a preventive i always say no but <laughs> the, um, I, I think it's a fantastic yeah. question yeah. Uh, and um the discussion about medications almost always is about starting them and almost never is about stopping them mm -hmm. with a lot of of patients it really depends um you know if things have been really bad for a few months you're able to be on a medicine within another few months you've been able to stabilize your symptoms i think it would be reasonable to at least look and see if it's possible to start decreasing the dose of the medication mm -hmm. not in a, you know not quickly not right away um there aren't a lot of studies that have looked at the length of the duration that you should be on you know a treatment for but the few that have have looked at staying on medications for somewhere between nine months and a year and a half so on average, about a year or so, a lot of times I say to my patients, you know, think about how long things have been bad for. If they've been bad for a couple of months or maybe a year or two, maybe staying on for about that long. If it's years and years and years, <laughs> it might not necessarily be the best option. Yeah. Um, in general, let's say you've been on a few different medicines and finally you found a good regimen and then the question is, do you need to be on all of that? Then you can also ask yourself, well, what are some of the things that really didn't seem to be that helpful over time. Mm -hmm. Is it worth you know, decreasing some of the medications if you're experiencing maybe side effects to some of them? Um, ideally, you want to be on as little as possible. The question is what that looks like, and it looks you know, uh, very different for different people. Yeah, and this is why Dr. Burke is the doctor and I'm a patient, because <laughs> I'm like, don't take me off my meds. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's such a great explanation. Um, someone had a question about migraine and ADHD. There's actually a really great website. Um, it's the, um, it's migraine and headache disorder. What, um, and they have a, like a comorbidity encyclopedia. And so you can go on, onto there and look, and it, it actually includes ADHD. So you can, you can see 
kind of the percentage of um, people who have the two conditions and learn more about it there. It's an encyclopedia. Dr. White actually has made, I think, a TikTok about it, um, and it's, it's a super helpful resource. Um, and so then what are some other things about vestibular migraine do we think that people need to know about? I, I know we were talking about treatments earlier and how treatment for vestibular migraine is a little different than um, other migraine mm -hmm. subtypes. Do you want to go into that some? Yeah, um, a lot of times people think about different, you know, and there are some specific treatments that we like to think about. Um, sometimes people will take, and, and you know, I, I would say, you know, speak to your doctor. Every situation is very different. Um, but a lot of times with vestibular migraine, your doctor may say Botox, right? And you're like, I don't know, that sounds like something you would use for regular migraine. And sometimes being on a combination of something that's a little bit more specific for mm -hmm. the vestibular symptoms and something that's uh, more uh, specific for the migraine uh, process that's happening in your brain can be very helpful. So, um, you know, sometimes let's say uh, there are, you know, it's, it's more anecdotal evidence, but for things like Timolol eye drops, or uh, I would say, you know, specific kinds of blood pressure medicines that we don't use as much in migraine. Verapamil would probably be the most common one, where I would say a lot of times for standard run-of-the-mill migraine, it's fallen out of favor. The evidence isn't fantastic for it, but people will use it a little bit more for vestibular migraine specifically, and sometimes being on a combination of, you know, one plus another. Uh, we mentioned SNRI um, medications. People use those oftentimes just for migraine, but I would say uh, the evidence for vestibular is a little bit more, more robust, so people would tend to rely a little bit, you know, more heavily on that. Uh, another medication that some people will use, not just for vestibular migraine, but for um, other kinds similar to vestibular migraine of, you know, almost uh, chronic aura states as opposed to chronic pain type states mm -hmm. uh, would be something like lamotrigine, which is lamictal, and some people will use that. Is there tons of evidence? One. Yeah. Is there tons of evidence for it? Uh, not tons. Uh, mm -hmm. There are no, you know, randomized controlled trials. Um, there are case studies and case reports and a lot of, you know, anecdotal evidence and presentations and expert opinion and uh, a lot of times with vestibular migraine just because it isn't as commonly found as, uh, you know, other uh, subtypes of migraine, there aren't as many great studies. Yeah. And then, so let's go into vestibular rehab therapy. And I think that there is something when I first was diagnosed with vestibular, vestibular migraine, it, vestibular rehab therapy wasn't explained properly to me and mm -hmm. how one should go about vestibular rehab therapy and how one can be successful in it. Because I technically failed vestibular rehab therapy. Which is very common. Yes. <laughs> so you want yeah. to go into that? I mean, failing vestibular rehab doesn't necessarily mean, it's not, the first thing you have to realize is, is when your doctor is recommending vestibular rehab, they're not necessarily trying to make a diagnosis. So let's say if you do really well or you don't do really well, that doesn't mean that you definitely have or definitely don't have vestibular migraine. One doesn't, uh, you know, correlate with the other. Uh, the kinds of exercises that they do are very different if the issue that you have is vestibular migraine or like you mentioned before, BBBV. Uh, you mentioned like the Epley maneuver. That's mm -hmm. a specific kind. And there are, I'd say like four or five different maneuvers that they'll probably teach you if you have BBPV. The goal being to get those little rocks, those otoconia, back in the place that they're supposed to be in your ear. The purpose of vestibular migraine is very different. More than anything, it's really acclimating yourself to specific uh, triggering situations and activities. That's, that's really what it is almost more than anything else. And there are certain eye exercises that can definitely trigger your symptoms. Um, think about it kind of as, you know, physical therapy for your brain. And if you think about it, let's say, you know, you injured your rotator cuff. Uh, you don't want to go to physical therapy, even though you kind of have to, because every time they move your shoulder, it is, I mean, you're, you're in agony. It's, it's extremely painful, but the more that they do it, the better eventually that you'll get. You may sometimes have to be in physical therapy for something like that for months, sometimes even longer. Let's say a person had surgery and it was a very successful surgery. That doesn't mean that they're good to go. They're, they're not, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, lifting up a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred pound dumbbell. Um, they are, you know, they, they have to go through extensive, you know, therapy afterwards to strengthen those areas. Similarly, even as you're improving with vestibular therapy, 
you still have to push yourself a little bit more, a little bit more uh, with some of these exercises. Uh, a lot of times, the real uh, strides that make the real improvement, it isn't even so much the one-on-one -on -one with the therapist, it's more the exercises that they'll give you at home. So they'll probably mm -hmm. say, here are three things that you, that you can do. It'll take you 30 seconds, do them three or four times a day. And if you do them, you'll feel awful. No question, especially the first few times that you do them, you'll be like, I do not want to do this. It's very simple, it's awful. I get very nauseated, it's triggering all of my symptoms, but the purpose is to acclimate yourself to doing it. So it's tough. Um, a lot of times failing physical therapy means that you're just not ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. And you know, it may be that your doctor has to um, you know, escalate or optimize the preventive medicine so that way, you know, these you'll be less triggered or even when you get triggered the symptoms are a little bit less severe you know nobody wants you to be throwing up all over the physical therapy place right that's not going to be ideal for them either that was me yeah so so you know that's that's not the goal the goal is not just to to you know push yourself you know to no end um the the purpose is to get you to slowly acclimate and get better and better at doing specific tasks yeah and i think what wasn't explained to me was that like since i hadn't been on a preventive treatment that was very successful mm -hmm. i probably was doing too much at once mm -hmm. but i didn't have a headache specialist at that time i just had a neurotologist so it it wasn't probably the best care but everything that I learned during vestibular rehab therapy I then was able to apply later down the road once there I you. had my meds that were working and so I still like even today when I was walking through Grand Central I was able to continue applying those tactics that I learned during mm -hmm. vestibular rehab therapy back when they taught me how to walk down a hall again um, and I still apply them every day when I'm going across crosswalks or mm -hmm. going through any busy New York street um, so I found that really helpful. And then I also found the vestibular cognitive behavioral therapy super helpful, which mm -hmm. I don't know how many other places offer vestibular cognitive behavioral therapy, how commonplace that is. It's not that common, mm -hmm. right? A lot of that is also kind of processing yeah. how all of this makes you feel and um, thinking about the kinds of things that do trigger you, um, trying to maybe actualize a plan as to, okay, um, going through Grand Central might be too much for me right now, but what can I do where the goal is eventually to be mm -hmm. able to go through Grand Central? What are some things that I can do that will eventually get me there? And part of it will be, you know, uh, trying some of those exercises that you learned uh, or other tips and tricks in, you know, less triggering environments, getting more used to it, building mm -hmm. up your confidence, and then eventually, you know, reaching that goal. Uh, sometimes it's with groups, which mm -hmm. is uh, helpful. Sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. And is that something that we offer at Nura, where like some level of that coaching? There's... So absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, the, our head of coaching, uh, Carrie Sears, is you know he sees a lot of vestibular migraine and other kinds of refractory, mm -hmm. uh, you know, migraine and other headache uh, disorders. And um, a lot of it is goal setting and supportive care and trying to figure out. You know what's the best approach to eventually get you to that goal mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't necessarily say and he also wouldn't say that necessarily follows CBT mm -hmm. you know I would say that's more you know uh, you know a formal you know PhD or PsyD therapist um, uh, you know Carrie is a certified health coach and he actually has you know trained you know multiple you know dozens of other certified health coaches uh, and had again other you know health conditions also and the goal really is um, to think about things in this light and to eventually get you to reach the goals mm -hmm. that you need to get to yeah and I think it's like goal setting when I first was diagnosed with migraine was so important and every single week I would give myself a new goal whether it was walking a certain number of steps mm -hmm. or walking to XYZ location just any way to motivate myself because um, I think when you're when you're kind of trapped in the just in the horribleness of migraine it's it's really difficult to find hope and setting goals and, and attaining those goals um, can be incredibly helpful and in the beginning I would set really easy goals <laughs> just so baby I would steps. have something to celebrate yeah, and get Absolutely. myself a sticker for mm -hmm. um, okay I see we have more more and more questions um, so yes let's see so um, 
someone wanted to know about vestibular cognitive therapy, which we kind of went through. And when I did vestibular cognitive therapy, it was, it was similar to what Dr. Burke had said. It was more about like talking through certain situations and how he's going to be prepared for it. And then we did a lot of, we talked a lot about like meditation and circle breathing. Um, but I think that everything that I did in the cognitive behavioral therapy for um, vestibular migraine would be something that Carrie would be able to address. And that it's, it's like, okay, I had this event and this is, this is how, like, this is how I'm going to prepare for it. If I get a vestibular migraine attack during this event, what am I going to do? Okay, I have my, my migraine stick with me, so I'm going to use that. If I'm feeling nauseous, I'm going to smell it. If I'm feeling pain, I'm going to roll it here. Um, if I'm feeling dizzy, I'm going to find a corner and I'm going to sit on the ground and I'm going to count to 10 until I feel and do that over and over again until I get to my baseline. And so we would kind of talk through those things over and over again until um, when I would actually go to those events, it became kind of second nature and it became part of my, mm-hmm. just now it's ingrained in me. So when I go anywhere, grocery stores, et cetera, um, that's what my instinct is to do. and it, like the experience isn't so scary because I know what to do, um, if that makes sense at all. Um, so I think we have other questions that um, might not be parti- like specific to vestibular migraine. What's your number one tip for people with vestibular migraine? Don't think that you're alone. I think honestly more than anything. Um, I, I have so many patients that say, have you ever had anyone, have you ever seen anyone who's had any of my symptoms? And you may not necessarily know somebody who has had your symptoms, um, don't give up hope and don't think that you're the only person in the world that is going through this. Definitely think about reaching out to some of the support groups. There's a very good vestibular migraine support group uh, on Facebook, but there are so many people in you know the the the, the headache world, the headache space. Um, you know on all you know different social media, you know apps and and um, you know people. You you can learn a lot from other people's experiences. Um, you can, I, you know, I think you'd be shocked by, you know, the, the, um, the similarities and the differences also of what people are going through. And this is like a real thing and people really go through, uh, and experience these kinds of symptoms and they definitely can do well. Um, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, things, you know, will automatically be a hit the first time that you use it. Find, you know, a good, um, you know, specialist who's seen and treats vestibular migraine. A lot of times if you see somebody who is, you know, more of a general neurologist, they may not necessarily know, thank you, but but they may not necessarily have that many patients with vestibular migraine. They may not necessarily take your symptoms very seriously. So I would say, um, you know, speak to, to somebody, try to find someone. That's, that's, you know, what we're here for. Uh, we see a lot of patients that have vestibular migraine and other kinds of complicated headache issues. And uh, you know we have a pro- you know we, we have specific approaches. We try to individualize everything. We try to go through you know what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you, what tests are you missing? Maybe there's something that uh, you know you've, you've you know we, we've all totally missed. We're calling it vestibular migraine, and maybe it's something else. So I don't think that you're alone, and find someone uh, that can really you know, lead you through this. Yeah. And I, I will say, um, having now worked at Neura, um, it's amazing to see how quickly patients can get in to see Dr. Burke, another headache specialist, um, and also Jasmine, who's the PA. Um, I like, I've known people who they were desperate to get in and then they were able to see Dr. Burke in like 24 hours. So if you're really struggling with vestibular migraine and you're needing a second opinion or you're just desperate to see a doctor, he's right here and he knows what your experience is because he has vestibular migraine um, and he knows what you're going through and he knows how to treat it. And I have to say, um, I've, I've seen a lot of headache specialists and Dr. Burke probably knows more about like off-label treatments than most of the headache specialists I've seen as a patient. Um, And the only other place where I've seen like your knowledge of off-label meds is when I was at UCLA Um, and their knowledge was spooky. So your knowledge is spooky, (laughs) Um, but in a good way. (laughs) So um, just don't, don't forget that like there is that resource and there is care coaching that can be involved too. My tip if you have vestibular migraine is to not stay inside. 
Um, when I first Great. was diagnosed with vestibular migraine, I, I lived in a studio apartment and I did not leave that apartment because everything was so triggering. And the more I stayed inside, the more triggering the outside world was. The fences that I walked by, they would trigger me. The, just the shadows of the trees would trigger me. Everything was triggering. Um, everything was moving and undulating and that made everything so much worse. I couldn't even go into a corner store. Um, I had to have friends help me into a corner store to just buy groceries. So don't, don't stay inside. I know it's really tough, but try to stay as you know, more active as you can be because the more you challenge that vestibular system and the more you kind of habituate to the outside world, um, the easier that world will be to tolerate. And I think one of the reasons I'm, my vestibular migraine is under better control is because I, I do, I challenge my vestibular system so much and I ride the subway and I kind of do all the things. Um, and there was a video, I, I actually have it in my vestibular migraine playlist that I used to watch and it has this red dot that you follow. Mm. I, do you know that one where it has yeah, the black and white absolutely. lines? And I would I watched that video every single day for like a year until I could get all the way through the video. And that video helped me so much in order. It helped me learn how to process animated GIFs. It helps me learn how to process any kind of motion graphic or anything like that on a screen. And it really helped me be able to work on a screen um, so that I didn't have to rely so much on the Flux app or other things um, just because it was teaching my brain how to process motion. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go through some other questions and then we'll start to wrap things up. Um, okay. Uh, migraine attacks being triggered by hunger. How common is that? Uh, so the question is, is it triggered by hunger or could hunger potentially be a premonitory symptom? Right? That so I would definitely say that that happens a lot also. Um, GI symptoms very commonly are associated with migraine, nausea being the most common. Um, oftentimes before a migraine, you're a little migrainey, people would call that a prodrome after mm -hmm. a migraine, even after the headache is gone, you might be a little migrainey and we would call that a postdrome. And a lot of times you could be experiencing a premonitory symptom. In other words, you're a little bit migrainey and it can manifest sometimes as nausea or sometimes, you know, as uh, not wanting to eat anything or sometimes being ravenously hungry. I've definitely seen that. Yeah. So, you know, is it that eating is the, you know, eating anything is the trigger. I mean, there, there may be specific food triggers also, mm -hmm. and definitely think about that. We actually have a specific care plan for people who are trying to figure out what, you know, whether a specific kind of food trigger is, uh, you know, affecting or causing your, your you know, migraine attacks. But uh, I'd say think about that as a yeah. possibility. Yeah. And I know, like, ever since the information started coming out about prodrome and kind of food cravings and stuff, I've, really? I've become much more knowledgeable or much more aware. Like mm -hmm. before I get an attack, I usually am going to want to eat a lot of chocolate and gummy bears. And now I like after I eat the chocolate and gummy bears <laughs> and I get a migraine attack, I'm like, oh wait, that was why. Um, so yes, that that's a good one. A lot of people are asking like from different states who we would recommend. So this is just a reminder to y'all. Nura is, it's a virtual neurology clinic. So we're everywhere. We're everywhere. If you are a patient in Texas, Dr. Burke can see you. Licensed in Texas. He has a license in Texas. If you're a patient in Arizona, Dr. Burke can see you. So the way you can sign up for NeuroHealth is if you go to my bio link, um, there's actually, I think it's the second line in there. Um, it says like to sign up for NeuroHealth, it actually will give you a discount um, for the membership fee. And then that, that can get you in um, as a Neuro member. So you can um, get access to care coaching and to other benefits of NeuroHealth. And then it also will give you an opportunity to schedule an appointment with um, Dr. Burke or one of our other specialists or PAs. So um, that's just a reminder. That was one of the reasons why I wanted to work at Neuro was because I remember one time there was, um, I had a follower who was in Maine and they were saying, there's not a headache specialist in my state. Um, and I don't know what to do. I, I think the closest headache specialist is in Massachusetts and Boston at Brigham and Women's. And I was thinking to myself, this is horrible. There are only a few hundred headache specialists in the country. And the reason I stay in New York is because that's where the bulk of them are. 
And so what Nura is doing is they're giving people access to headache specialists in your home. So all you have to do is log into Zoom and you can see someone. Um, so again, if you're, if you're looking for a specialist, someone who specifically is trained in headache and migraine management. So Dr. Burke is a neurologist and then he also did fellowship in mm-hmm. headache medicine. Yep. Um, he like he's one of the best and he's a he's a migraine advocate too so he's really involved where are all the places where you advocate you yeah just... headache on the hill every year is is absolutely a highlight and definitely um you know look up headache on the on the hill it's uh, uh one day a year uh, advocating specifically for funding and access uh, in different ways uh for for uh, you know migraine and other headache conditions sometimes it's a cluster uh, but most often it's migraine and year after year, you know, we're able to, uh, you know, do some real good and make some significant, you know, uh, differences, um, you know, earmarking, you know, bills and, you know, politics aside, making sure that migraine, which is so common, actually gets funded because it's extremely underfunded. Uh, American Migraine yeah. Foundation, um, the, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, uh, migraine meanderings, usually I do uh, once a month, a, a, a ask the doctor section. Um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm actually on the uh, editorial board of the American Migraine Foundation. So a lot of um, the, um, uh, you know, different blog posts or, mm-hmm. you know, other information that, uh, that comes out, uh, you know, I have a lot of say in also. Yeah, and you're doing an Instagram Live with Migraine Strong on Thursday. So if y'all would like to hear more of um, Dr. Burke speaking about yep. balance awareness and vestibular migraine, you can catch him on um, that with uh, Migraine Strong. So we'll go through um, some more questions. Um, and I'm trying to see. So, um, so yeah, the, someone was saying to, to keep continuing with the vestibular therapy like the exercises even though you're challenged and um i would say do yeah do your best and just like do a little bit um mm-hmm. day by day um and it that it's like the more you do the easier it, it gets to um to live with so someone wanted to know um if if migraine um, or vestibular migraine can be chronic absolutely yep <laughs> yep, I, I have chronic migraine, um, so I have, which means that I have, what's the, I always confuse it, it's 15... 15 days of headache yes. per month over the, you know, uh, uh, three months on, on average, 15 or more days of some headache. The majority of those, so like eight plus, with some features of migraine. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's that's the definition of uh, chronic migraine. And um, usually when we think about those 15 days of headache, we usually think about pain. And there are other similar kinds of subtypes of migraine where it isn't the pain that's constant, um, it's something else that's constant. It can sometimes be visual change, we call that visual snow. It can be vestibular symptoms, we call that vestibular migraine. For some people it can be you know, GI symptoms and nausea, and sometimes you're going from you know, GI doctor to GI doctor, they can't really figure it out. So um, you can definitely have some of these other subtypes of migraine. Yeah, yeah, and um, I have I've had pain every day, and mm-hmm. I have migraine symptoms every day, and then I have attacks almost every day, so. Yeah, it, I'm chronic. Um, then, oh, uh, the one thing I was going to say about vestibular migraine, which I think a lot of people don't realize, is you don't need to have head pain um, to Correct. have vestibular migraine. So you can just be dizzy. And that was something that was really confusing to me in the diagnosis process because I didn't have head pain. Um, and so I was like, what? I don't have migraine because my head doesn't hurt. But in actuality, I, uh, I absolutely had migraine. Um, you definitely want to go through your symptoms with your specialist, mm-hmm. and sometimes some of these subtleties will make them think we talked about 3PD, we talked about BBPV, a lot of things with P's, but basically, um, you know, there, there, there are differences, and it may be that you have to see a neurotologist and do some of those tests and really figure mm-hmm. out, you know, is it an ear issue, is it migraine, is it something totally different? So obviously getting the, the right diagnosis is extremely important over here also. Yeah. And following the diagnostic criteria, like you mentioned, uh, you know, what those 
uh, happen to be based on your symptoms. Yeah, yeah, because I think doctor, my neurotologist said she could tell I had migraine within the first 30 seconds of seeing me <laughs> just by watching me walk. And then it was confirmed when she got to my, my um, family history. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, we'll go through two questions um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna tie it up because Dr. Burke has um, patients to see. Um, so, um, amavig and vestibular migraine, um, do you see like positive correlations between the two? I had a lot of success with the amavig, mm -hmm. particularly with my other migraine subtype. I, um, we were talking about this before mm -hmm. even, CGRP type medications, basically what Amovig is, it's uh, a monoclonal antibody, so it's an antibody that's like made in a lab that's very specific uh, for a specific purpose, and that purpose is to block um, CGRP, it's an inflammatory neurotransmitter that causes migraine. The manifestation of the migraine can be very different. For some people it's episodic type attacks, for some people it's chronic type attacks. And um, whether it's Amivig or you know the other two uh, injectables, which are Ajovi and Amgalini, now there is even a daily preventive, which is called Qlift, and that's oral. So there are you know actually a, a few of these different kinds of C CGRP class medications. Yeah, uh, especially if um, you know it, it really is migraine that's driving your symptoms. Being able to uh, you know uh, focus on the migraine aspect of a lot of this can significantly improve people. So that's why we were saying uh, sometimes it's worth thinking about uh, medications that can help migraine in general. Sometimes it's worth uh, trying some specific things that uh, have some evidence uh, in vestibular migraine specifically, maybe finding a combination of one of each or you know whatever works well for you. Uh, for some people, it's even Botox. Uh, which sounds like I was saying. You know, it, so it sounds crazy, right? It sounds like why in the world would Botox help me? I don't. I, I don't have the headache pain. You know, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I don't have pressure. I don't have throbbing. I don't have anything like that. And the answer is what Botox is able to do for migraine is stop the production on basically the the, the brain's level of these inflammatory neurotransmitters. And um, sometimes the combination of CGRP plus Botox can actually be what's the you know most impactful. That definitely helps a lot of people. So yeah, I would definitely say CGRPs can be helpful. Nothing is ever a guarantee for any individual, but I've definitely seen benefit. Mm -hmm. And then one other question I saw come through was um, someone had one migraine subtype. I think it was brainstem aura, and then it switched to hemiplegic migraine, mm -hmm. and they they now have kind of a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to know: is that common? Um, is that something that is seen in patients? Um, and just kind of how, how does that work with these more um, rare subtypes? Absolutely. Well, you know, what I would say is auras sometimes change. They're not always completely stereotyped. Uh, many people, I would say, who have some of the most common kinds of auras would say it's exactly the same time, the same, the same thing every single time. You know, it's always the backward C, and then it comes and envelops, you know, my entire, you know, vision and some zigzag lines, and then it dissipates as the pain gets worse, right? Some people will say it's exactly that every time, and I'd say for many people it is different. Sometimes it's, um, you know, very inconsistent, and you definitely want to talk about your symptoms with your headache specialist because sometimes an aura is not an aura. Right? Sometimes there can be other reasons why you're starting to experience some of these other symptoms that may mean that we need to repeat imaging or get a different kind of image. Maybe we'll, you know, because of that, we would want to get like vascular imaging, like an MRA. Maybe we would want to get an MRI with contrast to look a little differently at the brain uh, and, and some specific aspects of it. But it's not that uncommon if you have, for instance, you know, some brain some aura symptoms and you know, it starts to become more motor or, or, most, or more sensory or vice versa. It's definitely something that we do see, it's not unheard of. But you also want to make sure that you've discussed this with your headache specialist, that you can recognize what it really is aura or something very different. Um, one major red flag in general with regards to aura is, is it lasting more than an hour or not? If you have a specific aura attack that's lasting more than an hour, that's lasting more than an hour, you definitely want to make sure that your headache specialist, you know, knows what's going on. Um, you know, the, 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 it can theoretically imply, um, you know, something beyond just aura and, um, it's, it's something to be on top of. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, that, that's mm -hmm. helpful. 
<laughs> sure. All right. So everyone, thank you so much for joining. If y'all would like to hear more from Dr. Burke, join us for an Instagram live with Migraine Strong this Thursday. Um, we're going to put up on our Instagram, um, mm -hmm. on Nora Health's Instagram stories, a reminder in just a moment. Um, so it'll be the afternoon on Thursday afternoon. So he's going to be speaking about vestibular migraine then. So if you came into this late, you'll be able to catch him then. And Nora Health will be sharing more tips um, about vestibular migraine on TikTok and on Instagram this whole week. So I hope that y'all found this helpful. And um, just remember, if you are looking for a headache specialist who understands vestibular migraine, because they have vestibular migraine, it's are. Dr. Burke, and you can sign up for NeuroHealth in my bio link, um, and it also includes the discount code, so you can get $15 off your membership. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.